Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation 20, we saw Satan bound for a thousand years, thrown into the pit, along with all those who would follow him. We got that angel that comes down and binds Satan and throws him into the pit for a thousand years. We see the first resurrection and um, the final battle against God on earth and the incarceration of the beast, the false prophet in the lake of fire and sulfur and all those who would follow them. John was also shown a glimpse of the great white throne judgment with the dead great and small standing before the throne of God. Books were opened and if the names were not in that book, the Lamb's Book of Life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. It's a scary, scary thought that people would not have their names written in there. Death and Hades, the two instruments that God uses to be able to sort people out, is then also thrown into the lake of fire. There's no longer use for them. There's no longer going to be a place where they will be needed. The lasting vision of, of the 20th chapter is the thousand years of Jesus' reign on earth. Um, it's something that we can't even imagine. I don't know about you, but I would love to see a thousand years. I mean, I would love to see 10 years on the earth without a war, but that seems to be um, uh, something that is just not going to happen in our lifetime. With Satan bound and evil bound up, safety, peace are the norms on earth. No disease, no aging, no fear, no worry, just heavenly peace with Jesus at the center of all of humanity. People will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. We now get to chapter 21, the second last chapter in the last book of the Bible. Here in this, chap in this chapter, we see what John saw and we hear what John heard. So I want to ask a question. How do I get to heaven? If you, if you read through scripture and you, you don't quite know, um, there's a question that, that, that will be asked that I'm hoping we can explore on a later time is, how do I get to heaven? What, what do I have to do to get to heaven? Is, is it a chore that I have to do? Do I have to say so many prayers? Do I have to go on a pilgrimage? What do I need to do to get into heaven? To answer that question, we have, uh, first have to understand the definition of heaven and also the definition of hell. It's important to know what these two places are and how do you get to both. Well, heaven is the home of God, the abode of God, the place where God resides outside of time, outside of space. We know in our world there are three different heavens. First of all, the uh, Earth's atmosphere is called the heavens. Um, that goes right up until the uh, space starts. Then we talk about outer space. Outer space is, is way out there um, where the Hubble has gone and, and even further than that. And then thirdly, the third heaven is God's domain, God's home. The first two we know all about through our experience on earth. We see documentaries about the skies and we see documentaries about the planets. And, and like I said, Hubble telescope has shown us what is out there. Just, just a fraction of what is out there. But there's galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies, even further away that we, we, we have no um, known clue of, of, of what is happening. As I've said, the first two heavens we know by experience. But... We are unable, unable to know the third heaven because that is the abode of God. And there's only one person that has come down from heaven and has gone back to heaven. And that is Christ our Lord. No one except Jesus has done that. And he has given us all we need to know about heaven by the way of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. And, and, and encourages us as to what is heaven or what heaven is through scripture. In scripture, we read about what heaven is like, what it uh, exists for, and who gets to be there. As we know, there are two realities that everyone will live for eternity, either in heaven or in hell. 
See, there's going to come a time when the great white throne judgment will happen and people will stand before there. But everybody will rise again from the dead, if, if, if they are dead, and they will enter into two realities. It'll either be in heaven with God or it'll be in hell with Satan and his, his like. So now we know that you have to be saved to be in heaven. What about hell? What, what, what do you need to do to be in hell? Well, you need to reject Jesus. You need to reject the Holy Spirit. You need to say, I can pay for my own sin. I can, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. What is hell like? It is a place of eternal torment. Eternal punishment. Imagine being punished forever. Imagine for the rest of your life, say you in your 40s or 50s and you've got another 20 or 30 or 40 years left and for those 20 or 30 or 40 years you are punished every second of the day. Would you enjoy that? No, you wouldn't. You would not enjoy that. Hell is a place where relief of pain is never experienced. Not not experienced, never. There's not even a glimmer of hope in hell. If we ever look at uh, really popular passages like Luke 16, where um, uh, Jesus talks about uh, the rich man and Lazarus, it's a place of separation from God and anything good. I know you, you've been to uh, funerals where they joke about um, that it's going to be a party in hell, that all of their friends are going to be there and they're going to have a great time. They are not. There's not going to be any love. There's not going to be any peace. There's not going to be any security. There's not going to be any, any mercy there. Nothing good would exist in hell. We read that the, gates, uh, the, the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many will go down those roads. Jesus not only references hell, but describes it in great detail. We've, we've seen in Luke 16, where he, he talks about it as a place of torment, a place of torture, utter torture. In Mark 9, 43, he calls it the unquenchable fire. There's places on earth where a fire has been burning for hundreds of years, where it just carries on burning and burning and burning. And it'll never, it will not be put out. Now, that's exactly what hell's going to be like. Unquenchable fire. A fire that just keeps burning. Mark 9, 48, it says, where their worm does not die. You will never die in hell. You will just be tormented for all of eternity. Matthew 25, verse 30 says, a place of outer darkness. I know when they've, when they've shown documentaries about outer space and they talk about the darkness that exists out there it's going to be nothing in comparison with what's going to exist in hell total separation from God so what is the reason for people going to hell there's got to be a reason if people have, have, have done stuff to go to heaven what must you do or mustn't you do to go to hell well sin must be punished and there are two ways our sin can be satisfied. Number one is by the sacrifice of Christ. Him on the cross, him paying for our sin. Him standing in my place, taking my punishment on his shoulders. Him making me clean with his righteousness. Then secondly, me paying for my own life. Me paying for my own sin. Me standing in that place of judgment, knowing that I'm going to be going to a place where uh, I'm totally separated from anything good, anything whole, anything joyous, anything peaceable. The gospel or good news of Christ is all about Jesus paying for our sin. That's, that's the essence of scripture. It's all pointing from the Old Testament towards the New Testament, um, towards Christ's sacrifice. It's all pointing from us now backwards to say that that's where our forgiveness comes from. is from the cross of Christ, his blood shed on our behalf. Jesus takes on the wrath of the Father to purchase our pardon. The greatest price that, that Christ could ever pay was for our souls. And he did that. 
You see, there is no other way. People might say that there is another way, but there's no middle path. There's no other way except for Christ dying for our sins. In chapter 21, we have a glimpse of heaven from John, John's writings, and he is a witness to the visions of heaven. I don't know if he could do it kind of justice, the, 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 the incredible sights that he sees, but he explains it as best as he can as you, as you read through the various uh, verses. Um, and let's see what John sees. He sees a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and our old earth has passed away. No more sea. I know I love the sea. I love to be at the sea, but there's not going to be a need for a sea. If we've got Christ and we've got God there in our midst, right there with us, I wouldn't need anything from my past life. Notice the, the old heaven and the old earth have passed away. They have, they have done their bit. They, they, they are now gone. There's no more need for them. Verse 2. God prepares the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Notice it says prepared as a bride. Now you know how a bride prepares for her special day. There is just so much that goes into a bride being prepared for a special day. We, Sharon and I got married when um, uh, it was very, very early in the morning. It was nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, I think she was up about 4.30 in the morning. And it was quite a process. I mean, I remember getting up and thinking, well, what am I doing? Why didn't we get married a lot, a lot later? But that's what we want to do. Now, can you imagine a bride being prepared, but God preparing Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, like a bride would prepare, except 10 times better, 100 million times better, because he knows his bride and he's preparing this wonderful, wonderful city of the new Jerusalem for us. God has prepared our future home. John 14, 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have, not, I would have, told, you, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. The holy city descends on the new earth. Verse 3, it says, Emmanuel, God with us. God is now part of who we are. He's with us in verse 3. And, 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 and I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and, he, and God himself will be with them as their God. Uh, we had a glimpse as to what Emmanuel would be like as Jesus uh, on earth walking. But now it's going to be totally different. No more sin. No more degradation. God with us. The holy city. Verse 4. What's the result of God being with us? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. The former things. What are the former things? Well, all the, all the, 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 the horrible things in life. The things that have brought us down, the things that brought that, 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 that were sinful in this world no longer is, exist because God is with us. And he says he's making all things new. Verse 6, God, who, who is he? Well, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is, is like no other. Nobody else in all of history is like our God. Look at verse 6. There's going to be a reward. He will supply drink to those who thirst after him. He will give an inheritance to those who overcome the conqueror. Those who overcome Satan. Those who stand against Satan. He will give an inheritance. You know, growing up, um, my parents lost everything. Um, my dad worked for most of his life. And then uh, bought into a business and then uh, a year or two later just lost everything. We had to go back to square one. And uh, you kind of think to yourself, well, you know, hopefully one day my parents will leave me something and I'll have an inheritance. Well, I didn't have that, but I know that I've got an inheritance in heaven. That, that my father has planned something and, and, and the Holy Spirit is a down payment in my heart of something that is going to be far greater than I can ever think. 
he will be their God and they will be his people. But notice there's going to be punishment as well. Verse 8, the second death, everlasting punishment. And we can see the list in verse 8. It is so sad that these people would exist. He says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Understand, if you, if you are one of those people that is cowardly or detestable or faithless or murderers or sexually immoral or sorcerers, idolaters, or liars, your portion, your reward is going to be punishment in the lake of fire. But you see, even though I say that now and it sounds so bad, there is still hope. There is still hope that you can be saved, that Jesus can pay for your sin. Then in verses 9 to 27, we have the description of the city. God is the glory of the city. No matter what it looks like, if God's glory wasn't there, it would look like a pile of rubble. Understand that God is the one that shines the light. God is the one that brings the presence of his glory right there. Look like costly things, clear crystal, jasper. Verses 12 and 14. Well, 12 to 14, what does that look like? It had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at each gate, 12 angels. At the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. So on, on, on these walls are these uh, 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 lists of all the 12 tribes of Israel. But, but, but there's more. It says um, that on the east, uh, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city uh, had... 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 12 apostles, well, there were only 11. Judas wasn't there, but I, I honestly think Paul will be one of the apostles. He's the one that, that um, wrote most of the New Testament, and I do believe that he is going to be one of the apostles there. If we have a look at the measurements, well, if you measure it out, what, 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 what comes up? Well, I want you to see this in your mind's eye. Think of a cube. Think of something that is squared, that is um, the same height, width, depth. And think of that, that cube in the, 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 the parameters of 2,414 kilometers cubed. That is an incredible cube. It's massive. Well, what is it made of? Well, let's look at verses 18 to 21. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. This place is going to be so amazing, so sparkly. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, crystallite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, crystal chrysophrase. The eleventh, jacinth. The twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the streets of the city was pure gold, transparent. Think of gold that you can look into and you can almost see the other side. That's what it's going to look like. But also what amazes me, especially somebody that loves the sea, is thinking that the, the, the gate is going to be of a single pearl. One, one um, uh, preacher said, well, can you imagine the size of that oyster? Can you imagine how big that would be? Verses 22 and 23, no temple is present there. Do you, do you notice that? There's no need for a temple because God is there. God is in her. No need for light. No sun, no moon. Because God shines his light everywhere. Well, how does this affect us? Verses 24 to 27. No day or night. 
No darkness or shadow. Always be open. If we think of, 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 of great cities of old, they, they would always close their gates at a certain time to protect them. They would have, always have these high walls to protect them from the outside, but these gates will always be open. All glory will be brought to God from all nations. We will worship Him forever. That's our work that we will do. Everything is new in the city and in heaven and on earth. All sin, anything unclean, will never enter into it. It has all been dealt with. All been dealt with. No evil deeds will be there. No falsehood. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those are the only ones that will be there. Isn't that amazing to see that, that God knows the names of those people already. And they're in that book. And one day that book is going to be opened. And all that list... Of verse 8 is not going to be there. So right now, as, we, as we've had a look at, 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 at chapter 21, and we think about the glory that awaits those who, who love God and call according to His purposes, where do you stand today? Where is your heart? Has Christ paid for your sin? Has He paid for everything that's in your life? Do you live your life for Him, or do you live your life for yourself? Will you one day see that place or will you be in the lake of fire? These are serious questions. And I know people are just going to say, oh, that's, that's for the future. No, it's for now. How we live in heaven is determined by how we live now. Everything we do here echoes through eternity. You're either with Christ or you're against him. Do you want to experience this beautiful new heaven, new earth? This wonderful city that's 2,414 kilometers cubed, where everything is just so beautiful. The gold is trans almost translucent. Wonderful city walls. Beautiful um, city prepared like a bride. Come to Christ. Explore what he's done. Read God's Word. If you've never read God's Word before and you've just stumbled upon this, please go to God's Word. Read the last book in the Bible called Revelation. Jesus reveals Himself to us. Come to Him. He's paid it all for you. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful that we can come, understand Your Word and live accordingly. Lord, we ask that um, you would really touch people in a special way to understand your word and then a living, live accordingly to it. Father, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for all that you are. In Jesus' name we pray.